This is the first part in a set of videos in which I will give you guidelines on scientific work in seminars, pro-seminars and bachelor or master thesis. What I will not do here is give you information about the research methodology itself because research methodology can differ very strongly from field to field. Uh, this does not only mean that uh, it is different in uh, history uh, in relation to computer science or in relation to mathematics, that's of course true, but even within a field, and here I'm speaking for computer science, it is uh, quite a, a difference between, uh, well, doing an interview study, maybe in computer science ed education research, and having a formal proof in theoretical computer science or uh, working on some piece of software which can then be analyzed and be evidence for some aspect uh, in, uh, com in uh, software engineering. So there is quite a range of uh, different research methodologies and this concrete methodology you have to figure out with your thesis supervisor or seminar supervisor if necessary. What I will tell you about here is how to do the literature work, how to support your work with literature, how to do presentations uh, of your work and how to write a thesis about your work. So these are more uh, common uh, topics which are uh, kind of true everywhere. In every kind of uh, uh, scientific research you have to do these things. However, these things can also differ from person to person of course and also from uh, the research community uh, of one field to the research community of another field. Um, so there are customs uh, involved and I will tell you what I know and what I consider best and what uh, fits best to my style of research, my area of research. Even within a field of computer science or uh, related uh, fields, um, there are differences and things are done differently. I will often point towards that, uh, but uh, I can encourage you already now to ask certain details or to determine certain details uh, with your uh, supervisor when these questions arise. This being said, what I tell you here is of course not only my opinion, it's not completely random stuff, it is uh, to a great degree established knowledge and uh, there are a few hints in there which I think will be useful regardless of where you do your work and uh, what the uh, concrete details are in the end. So, this uh, uh, video is about literature research and uh, literature research is a very important part of scientific work. Scientific work can never be without any um, determination of the state of the art. Uh, so if you write something down and it doesn't relate to anything out there and there's no systematic uh, perspective on what is out there, what has been out there, what has been done before, it cannot be scientific work. Scientific work is very much based on what is out there. When you look at uh, doctoral theses, for example, you will be very surprised that the amount of new stuff in there is often very, very small. So when you are writing the thesis, you have to look for sources and you have to select the sources. Then you go beyond the sources to some degree. You don't stay stick with them, but you go at least a step beyond that. And uh, during all of that, you display your scientific way of thinking. It makes clear that you can think as a scientist, that you ask the right questions and do the things in the proper way. Let's look into those things. Why do you do the literature research? You have to show that you know the state of the art. You're having some kind of new idea maybe, but that has to be founded, has to be based on what is out there already and what others thought about it. So you have to look for literature which shows what is out there. You have to show the state of the art. You have to show the state of affairs. And uh, 
Yeah, of course. There you, how do you do that? You do count some kind of, uh, of, of, of research uh, by some means. We'll go a little deeper into that in a moment. Um, but that can be very arbitrary. Um, and it must not be arbitrary. You have to make clear why you chose certain sources. You have to explain how you came up with the selection of sources. And that very much, of course, depends on the topic you have. Uh, often um, there uh, may, might be some kind of very well established resource which everyone is referring to um, which is uh, very popular and often cited. That c uh, is of course a good reason to use it too and uh, to make clear that that is the standard um, for a definition of whatever uh, you are looking for. In other areas where that is not the case, or where it is the case, but you want to go somewhere else and uh, have a, uh, maybe a little different perspective, you have to do a broader literature research and have to look whether there are papers out there about that, whether that has been investigated before, uh, and um, well, what they are about. In any case, you have to make clear why literature is chosen. It must never appear to be just a random selection of things that just came to your mind or that you just found on the search engine. So, okay, that's the literature research itself. Then you typically go beyond the uh, what you've found. So you are extending an approach, for example. So you found that something has been done in uh, uh, this and this way, but you could go a little further. You're, e you're extending it. You could question an approach. Something is quite established uh, in literature, but you are questioning it. You think uh, maybe it's not true or it's only true in certain circumstances. Uh, and then you are uh, questioning this approach and ha try have to figure out how to investigate that, how to answer the question you've, uh, um, you've uh, made uh, onto the approach. You can transfer an approach. That's also often done. Like something has been established in a certain area of research and then you transfer it to something else. For example, from, uh, from the field of uh, education, there is something which has been uh, very successful in uh, language education. And you think, well, maybe uh, programming is not so much different from uh, uh, other languages. Maybe I can transfer something from learning languages to learning programming languages. That would be a transfer of, uh, of, um, of an approach. You can then relate two fields that's kind of similar. It's like this is language, uh, natural language, uh, this is programming language. How do they differ? Let's make a comparison, things like that. So in the first step, you have built the state of the art, you have seen what is out there, and now you go beyond that. In the process of going beyond what you found in literature, you typically have research questions and hypotheses, even though they're not always called like that, but typically they exist. Research questions and hypotheses are very similar to each other. When you have a research question, you want to find out how something is through scientific means, through means of research. You want to, for example, find out whether people can learn uh, programming better when they're using Python in comparison to when they're using Java. That would be a research question. Um, you could also formulate that as a hypothesis. So you think that when using Python, they learn uh, programming better than when using Java. That would be a hypothesis. A hypothesis always needs to be supported by something. Um, you cannot just formulate an hypothesis just out of thin air. You have to have a good reason for that. So you typically develop that reason and then you say, ah, that leads me to the hypothesis that with a language like Python, uh, programming can be learned way better than with a language like Java. I'm making this all up. It's just to show you uh, how that is done and how those uh, things uh, fit together. And as you see, when you have such a research question, like uh, here, this question with Python and with Java, you would, of course, need to have supporting evidence uh, or people who 
either claim one or the other, and that would be your literature research. That is the state of the art. So there have been people speaking about the advantages of Java and why Java is a good language for programming, learning programming, and others have done similar things for Python, and maybe someone has even already done a comparison. All of these things have to be found and have to be uh, uh, brought onto the table. Your literature research is very important to justify your scientific way of thinking. Uh, you have to prove that you can think like a scientist, which means you have to justify your claims and assumptions. You cannot just claim something. You have to have support for a claim, which means you either have to have empirical evidence, like you have done an interview, you have done some measurements, that means you have empirical evidence for your claims. That's, of course, in the very heart of some scientific work. But it can also be argumentation, like logical argumentation, like you're seeing that this is this way, this is this way, and then you can find an argumentation which leads you to some, uh, to some um, resolution. And uh, that would also, of course, be a uh, justification. Or it can at least be uh, the basis for a hypothesis. And then you would do the empirical evidence. But of course, for all of that, you need references because it's all built on something. Not everything which is part of uh, your scientific work you have produced yourself. You have built on, upon many things and those things have to be uh, referenced. It is very important in scientific work that you never do or never make claims which are not falsifiable. Um, so, claiming something of which you have no idea how you would figure out whether it might be wrong it cannot be part of a scientific text. An important part also is to criticize your own approach. So, when you are doing scientific research, um, you often have to um, make the world a little easier than it actually is in order to figure something out. Uh, think about uh, the days back at school when you did uh, experiments in physics and in chemistry. This experimental setting is a non-normal setting and uh, research often happens in anormal settings. And of course, that can always be questions. Or for the sake of simplicity, you've said, I only look at this case and not at the other. And then later on, you could criticize that. Or you are doing some scientific work and find out that it's not as conclusive as you'd hoped. Don't hold back. Tell people that that's the case, because then the reader sees, ah, he has realized that himself or herself, and of course you can go beyond that later. That's part of scientific work, that you criticize your own work. So, you have to do a literature survey, and the question is, what is a valid source, what is valid material for scientific work? And there are a few things which can easily be checked, while others are more questionable. Where there is no question is literature which has been verified by experts or is peer-reviewed, which also means verified by experts, I'll tell you in a moment what that means, and what is publicly available. Those two things refer to uh, literature, scientific literature, which has been published in scientific journals or as uh, the material of a scientific conference, which is typically called proceedings, the proceedings of a scientific conference. When I hand something in to a scientific conference, it is peer-reviewed, which means other people, other scientists, have a look at it without knowing who I am. It's typically done blind and double-blind. Double-blind means I don't know who the uh, reviewers are too. Um, they look at it and uh, rate it and say whether it's good, good enough or not, on, or they tell me, uh, give feedback on what has to be improved. And what is then published should at least have a high enough quality to be published and it is something which you can cite. That doesn't, of course, not mean that it is true or that it cannot be questioned, but it is at least not complete nonsense, not completely random stuff. So that can typically be cited in a scientific, um, in a scientific work. That's 
Not a problem at all. It has to be publicly available, it says here. There are exceptions to that. And one of that would be uh, when you have oral communication. Like uh, you have read a paper by someone and have contacted that person. And they tell you that they later found out that something is a little different. Or they don't make a certain differentiation anymore. That would be oral communication. Uh, or it could be written communication, but it's personal communication at least. And you can uh, use that as a source as well. You would put that into a footnote typically and say that there has been kind of commu um, communication uh, with a scientist uh, in a certain area. What is also a source, at least for many of my seminars and theses, is kind of what I would call a primary source. Uh, what is a primary source? For many of my uh, seminars and uh, theses, um, well, um, manuals of things could be sources. Even commercials could be sources when they show certain things. Um, articles in magazines could be sources. Those are primary sources. You have to treat them differently. They are not this on the same level as a scientific source. Uh, most obvious uh, when you have commercials. You would never say what is said in a commercial is true. But what you can derive from a commercial it is, is that something is painted in a certain way, that something is characterized in a certain way. And that's of course something you can uh, refer to and have to refer to. Uh, so, manuals, magazines, product presentations, popular documentations, uh, those are sources, but they have to be treated differently. Please be skeptical. You also, by the way, have to be skeptical with uh, popular books on certain aspects, uh, especially when those books are written by protagonists. Uh, the best example, uh, I would say, is uh, books about the World Wide Web. Uh, written by Tim Berners-Lee himself, one of the inventors of the World Wide Web. And uh, he has a tendency to sing his own song. So you have to treat it all with a grain of salt. You have to be skeptical when having uh, these kinds of sources. And you have to do the same thing with all those other um, aspects, with other primary sources uh, as well. So, what about Wikipedia? What about websites? What about YouTube? I'm always asked those questions. Can I use Wikipedia in scientific work? And uh, I think you maybe have been given an answer to that already, or you feel an answer very strongly, and maybe a little surprised now by what I will tell you, uh, because the answer is not as much no as you would uh, maybe uh, imagine. Well, of course, you cannot use Wikipedia as a proof of something. You, that's not possible. And I can give you many examples of uh, articles uh, in Wikipedia where things are definitely wrong. Uh, and there are other things which are quite questionable. On the other hand, of course, we all know that Wikipedia is often right, that the information is very valuable. So Wikipedia is often a good starting point. And I think every scientist who says uh, he, he or she does not use Wikipedia um, from time to time uh, to look some things up is just lying. I, don't, I can't, don't assume that can be the case. It is very much a part of what we all use now, as maybe something like ChatGPT might in a few years. Um, I could imagine that happening. Uh, so when can you use uh, Wikipedia? Uh, I would say Wikipedia is a good source when you are referring to a public definition, when you just want to, to indicate that uh, out there, uh, or typically, uh, a certain air field is defined that and that way, or is characterized in a certain way. Uh, then you can use Wikipedia. I would say that's often in the introduction of uh, something. When you're having the introduction for your presentation or the introduction for your thesis itself, uh, it makes sense to, um, with, to base it something, to, to start with some common definition of something. And then Wikipedia uh, can be a good starting point, as did old uh, 
um, encyclopedias, but those are not around anymore. So Wikipedia has this kind uh, of status. And what about websites? Uh, well, uh, the website is not important. Uh, the, the question is not what the medium is. You can turn the argument around and you would see how ridiculous it is. Uh, some piece of information is not better or more valid just because you found it in a book which was in the library. So that's not that it is in the library uh, which makes something valuable, but it's other things. It's this being peer-reviewed, etc. So uh, the medium is not important, but the quality of the source. So you will find many scientific papers on the internet, uh, and you can use those as if they were printed. Typically, they have literature references which look as if they had been printed. Often, uh, they aren't printed anymore, but they are given kind of literature reference like that anyway. So you, they, you have uh, the publisher, you have uh, uh, page numbers, etc. You treat those things as if they, you had them in printed form. All the papers by uh, ACM, IEEE, etc. you typically now get from the internet. And of course you can use them uh, as if they had been printed material. They are just the scientific output uh, which I refer to uh, in, at the top. Then there are websites about projects, there are technical manuals, etc. Those, depending on the topic you are speaking about, of course you can also cite as primary sources, so with a grain of salt. What you have to avoid is personal blogs forums, etc. There might be an exception, like when, uh, for example, you are writing about some product by Microsoft and uh, there is a blog or a forum by a Microsoft developer. That has some value, of course, but uh, avoid forums, blogs, uh, or any other kind of content which is just by an enthusiast. That can, of course, be very good, but uh, it's very questionable. And it's often really bad. Uh, I can tell you that. Uh, what about YouTube? You see, the, uh, the first sentence is the same one because it's the same problem. Of course, it's not about the medium. Uh, it is about the content and the quality of the content. So there are uh, scientific presentations on YouTube which are uh, created by universities or by research institutions they have been put onto YouTube. Of course, you can cite those. It's like you had those in a printed form or in other a kind of um, form. Those can be cited. So you can cite YouTube videos by them. Uh, then there are videos which show projects. There are official presentations or even commercials. As I said, even commercials can be uh, referenced. Of course, you can use them. You can cite uh, those uh, things in their proper manner. And what you should avoid again, personal opinion videos, etc. Um, there is a big area which uh, unfortunately you have to avoid, uh, I am afraid. Uh, uh, this is, uh, well, videos created by very enthusiastic people who have a lot of knowledge about things and present all of that in very entertaining ways. I, for example, uh, like to watch videos about the formation of the London Underground and trains in the London area. And there are people who are so knowledgeable. But if I would use that in a scientific context, I could not use it. Of course, I could be inspired by it, uh, but I did, would have to find other sources and resources to base my uh, assumptions on. Because what they did... Well, it's not scientific enough uh, for that. But a commercial or something which has been presented by rail companies in the area, that can be used to, the, to a certain degree. So, you see, a lot of things are possible. We have opened it quite a lot. Please ask your supervisor for your area. That may be different in certain areas of research, even within computer science. Please ask whether that is true. It is true for my type of seminars and theses, uh, definitely. So, 
How do you do the literature uh, survey? Of course, how do you look for things? You use a search engine uh, like Google. And you can, of course, use Google to find uh, scientific literature and every kind of literature for that uh, matter. But if you just use normal Google, you're leaving out uh, important parts. And I can give you a hint. There are search engines which are especially good for finding scientific literature. And um, well, one is Google itself, but not the Google search engine like google.com or google.de, but you, uh, you enter scholar.google.com. And I encourage you and uh, suggest that you do that when you are at university or when that is not possible, when using a VPN connection to university. Because uh, the university library has access to many digital resources which they pay for. The state pays for it. So we as scientists and you as students of Paderborn University have access to it. And this is only available within the university uh, network or using a VPN then also within the university network. And Google Scholar knows that and realizes that. So when you look in there, you will you can do the, uh, the, uh, the research and you will get results. You would get the same results uh, at home too. But when you are at the university network or connected to it, uh, the full text entries are presented on the right hand side and you get access to it directly from the Scholar, from Google Scholar search engine. So that is a good uh, hint to use that one. You can use other search engines in the scientific area as well, of course. Um, by the way, uh, a, a good uh, tip maybe. From time to time, you might find something uh, on Google Scholar which you would like to read but you have no access to it. Uh, whatever you try, you don't. Uh, try entering the information into the normal Google search engine. Maybe uh, put a PDF behind that. And more often than not, that piece of information has been uploaded to some server somewhere and then you have it. Just saying. Uh, so then there is of course here Wikipedia. Uh, what Wikipedia, what do I mean? Uh, didn't I just tell you you cannot use that uh, as reference? Sure, you cannot use Wikipedia itself as your uh, basis for something. But what is put into Wikipedia is by itself supported with literature. So there are references in Wikipedia. And uh, looking for a topic in Wikipedia and then consulting the references which you find in there is a very good starting point. Because these references are often of a kind which uh, are very broad, which uh, explain the thing in a kind of easy enough manner. Uh, it's a good starting point. The references in a Wikipedia article should in any case be uh, considered. It would be a waste if you would not look into those. Of course, um, which is up and put here, you can go into the university library and have a look for books. There, Those things still exist. Uh, so if you don't find uh, something in a digital um, uh, way, have a look at the book and uh, use that. But of course, everything recent, at least in computer science, uh, should be available uh, digitally. So, you have found some literature, have gone through it, and maybe it's interesting, maybe not so interesting. Uh, what can you do now? Have a look at the interesting literature and have a look at the end of it, where they have their literature references, and see who ha they have referenced. This way you can trace back, you can go backwards, and often find interesting literature which has been published before, which might be even more close to your topic. Or it is the broader view. Both can be very interesting. Well, of course, uh, often it would be interesting to do it the other way around. You have found a good piece of literature and uh, you are quite sure that other people have uh, built upon that. How would you, you find that? You can use Google Scholar again. Uh, have a look what, uh, at what it says here. I looked uh, uh, for the von Neumann uh, architecture uh, and found it, the first draft of a report on the AdBack. And you see on the right hand side, by the way, it says a full text at UB Paderborn. So there's the full text available at the university library. So I could click on there and would get the full, uh, um, the full text. 
because uh, we paid for it. Uh, I think that one would have been publicly available uh, anyway, but for many things that's the way to go. Uh, but what I want you to point you to now is this cited by 1,335. So the Google uh, Scholar itself found 1,335 papers which refer to this paper. And you can click on that and you get a list of those. And it's, of course, sortable by, uh, by uh, a number of um, properties. Sometimes, by the way, just recently happened uh, to a colleague of mine, he, was, he had a very interesting uh, paper and uh, did exactly that. And then he found that a few years later, the same scientists revisited their own research and he got more insight. So that's a good, always a good hint. Have a look at who cited uh, the paper and search engines help you quite a lot. As I said, when you have found literature, this literature itself will have used other pieces of literature to support their claims. If you want to use those, so you want to kind of borrow their literature, please try to find the original literature and have a look into it. This is often not done properly and it leads to the most awful distortions of what has been indicated and what is understood. I try to give you a good example. So please always to find, try to find the original source. I give you an example which uh, occurred to me a few years ago. There's a popular quote in many papers about computers in schools. And this quote goes like, uh, like this. Thinking about the computer's role in education does not mean thinking about computers. It means thinking about education. And then it's often referred to Ellis, 1983. Where is this used? It's typically used in the context of um, not relying on technology too much, not uh, focusing on technology as much as people think it is done, but focusing on teaching, to focusing on pedagogical things. It is more or less used in a kind of uh, anti-technological sense. Uh, okay, it, is, it seems to support that, uh, or at least it is uh, something which goes into that direction. Uh, so I tried to find that and I found it. Uh, I found it in a book which is called The Use and Misuse of Computers in Education. Strange, for some strange reason, it's not from 1983. It's from 1974. So there is a difference of nine years and this difference makes some difference because uh, in computer technology, there's a very, very big difference uh, between computers in 1974 and computers in 1983. Way more than there is a difference between computers in nineteen uh, in twenty twenty three uh, compared to uh, twenty thirteen. Those are kind of the same, and you can still use the computer from twenty thirteen, but nineteen seventy four, nineteen eighty three. That's the difference. Uh, well, what do I find in there? Let's have a look. Uh, I found the uh, piece of uh, text, and I've the book now. Back then, I have only looked it up in Google Books and could find the. Uh, the paragraph uh, where the where this is from and you see for us the assertion that automation means thinking procedure becomes thinking about the computer's role in education does not mean thinking about computers it means thinking about education there you have the quote in italics it is in there very well everything fine no it isn't have a look what it says here what is this text about it speaks about automation and it speaks about the automation of education. And what uh, the author wants to say here is, if we want to automate education, which was a very important topic or a very hot topic in the 70s, uh, we want to automate education, we have to think about the education we want to automate. So we have to analyze the educational process to create a model of it. 
and then put it into a computer. So we have to have the focus there instead of how the computer works. But it is exactly used in the opposite sense of what it is then used for. Uh, it is now used in, this, in the sense of uh, we must not use computer at school, we should focus on education. But what was meant was we have to look into education very deeply to use computers in school instead of teachers. So please have a look at the original sources, if at all possible. If that shouldn't be possible, there is always the possibility that uh, um, ancient book is not available anymore. You cannot, can't, somehow cannot get those things. What do you do then? Then you say, you, you use the citation, uh, if you want to cite it, and say cited as in, and then you say where you have got it from. That gives the reader or the listener in a presentation a hint on where that comes from and that there is an intermediate. Okay, uh, references. Uh, when we look for literature, we have to refer to that literature. Okay. As I said, we have to base everything we do on sources, literature or other sources. I call it literature, even if it's a film, we call it literature. It doesn't matter, on sources. You have to build it on sources. And these sources you have to refer to in your own text. So those become then references. How do you manage those? Uh, the most important tip I can give you is as soon as you find something somewhere and want to use it in your own scientific work, write down where you got it from. So put down a note, that's the fact, or even do a copy-paste, so it would be a citation, and then write next to it where you got it from. And do that immediately at once. Don't do it later. Do it at once. Because if you happen not to do it, you just put something somewhere. And later on, you have thought about all of that uh, at length. It could easily happen that you don't realize yourself anymore that you got it from somewhere else. And uh, that can lead to unintentional plagiarism. Plagiarism we will speak about at length in another video. But plagiarism is something we have to avoid at any cost. So as soon as you got something from somewhere else, please make a note. Put the literature reference right there. You can use software for that. There is software like Citavi, uh, Zotero, like, there is software like uh, Citavi, Zotero. There is software you can use for literature management. There is even simpler literature management in word processors like Word, LibreWrite. There is, uh, if there is a possibility in there to use uh, their literature management, which is then attached to the file you're writing. If you're using LaTeX, you have the BibTeX standard, and there is software which handles that because the files are a little obscure to edit yourself. Uh, the, the, the syntax is not the easiest uh, to manipulate, I would say. But never mind. If you use a plain text file, put it into a plain text file, whatever you do, just do it. That's the important thing. The longer your work becomes, the more it makes sense to use software for it, of course. But for a short paper, for a, a short uh, seminar uh, presentation. You could do it with a text file, doesn't matter, but please think about writing down the literature references, always, all the time. Do it while doing your literature research. So you're going through a lot of literature. For every piece of literature, you can just read the abstract and the introduction, and then you know quite well what it is about. And you can extract a few of those uh, insights, put it onto a piece of paper or into a text file, and right next to that, claim where you have that from. When going through literature, it is important to know that in literature they are not telling you the truth. 
they're not lying, that's not what I meant, and they're typically not distorting things. But uh, of course, it's human being doing those things, uh, there are methods which are limited, so what is in there is a contribution to finding the truth, but it's not the truth. So, when you read that, question what is in there, question the claims, question the methodology. Is the methodology even capable of figuring out what they tried, what they think they figured out, or is it questionable? Question the world views, question the assumptions which have been made beforehand, because often those things, of course, creep into the literature. And uh, you should always question what you read. That's a very important thing. So when you write things down, go to from literature, write down what it says, also write down the questions, write down what you question about it. That in consequence means that you look for other literature which either supports it or which opposes it. So look for literature which goes into a different direction too. Don't fall into the confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is that you have a certain opinion and you now th try to find things which support your opinion. But when working scientifically, we also have to look for things which go against that opinion. That might be a little inconvenient, might, feel you, uh, might make you feel a little unwell, <laughs> but it is something really important, it's part of scientific work, to question yourself and to question what you find somewhere else. Questioning things, that is science. Science is always doubting, questioning those things you find. By the way, not only the truth does not exist, also the definition typically does not exist. Uh, except from mathematics. People who do mathematics define their own world just for themselves. And of course, when you do that, when you define everything, you can have clear definitions. But us, or everyone else, <laughs> so to speak, trying to figure out what the world is, how the world is, and how to uh, cope with it, there typically is not a definition. You can always find another definition uh, which is similar but a little different or which is even completely different. So what I then typically do is I don't define things, I characterize them which is a little uh, lower than a definition, hard definition. I have a characterization and it is almost like that or typically like that. Um, it often helps uh, to go that way and not to define things. With these words, I want to end this video, which has been long enough about uh, literature research, but want to invite you to watch the next video, which is not really about literature research, but something which is kind of in the area, or might be part of it soonish. Uh, I want to speak with you about uh, chat, GPT and similar systems and uh, how you can use those in the formation of your thesis. And uh, well, it's not that easy a topic, so I'll, we'll have to spend a few minutes on it. That would be the next video. And after that, we would continue with a video on the presentation of your scientific work. Thank you very much for this one.